Hello and welcome to Out of the Fog. I'm Karen Hager. Each week at this time, we gather for spiritual conversation with enlightening guests, and I'm glad you're here. You can find more about my work as an intuitive guide and spiritual teacher at karenhager.com. Now then, heartbreak and misfortune and bad choices and just nonsense, that comes with the territory here in Earth School. And it's human nature to have those things affect us, affect us deeply, and we can develop not so great coping mechanisms sometimes to try to cover up our pain, to try to hide maybe those unresolved, not so great things that happened, what my guest might call a a waking nightmare or living nightmare. My guest today is Kelly Sullivan Walden. She believes that we can alchemize challenges and obstacles into meaningful healing growth. When we're going through a living nightmare, and it happens to all of us sometime, Kelly's got some ideas to help us turn something not so great into meaningful self-exploration. Are you ready to meet her? Kelly Sullivan Walden, who's also known as Dr. Dream, is an award-winning, best-selling author of 10 books. Her latest is A Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Waste. A dream expert, certified clinical hypnotherapist, inspirational speaker, and workshop facilitator, Kelly also holds a doctorate degree in interfaith studies. Her unique approach to dream work led her to consult with thousands of people from Fortune 500 executives to celebrities to stay-at-home moms. She hosts the Kelly Sullivan Walden Show podcast and is the founder of DreamWork Practitioner Training. That's an online professional development program that empowers people to incorporate dream work into their careers. You can find more about everything, the book and the programs and the everything at kellysullivanwalden.com or ihadthestrangestdream.com. Kelly, welcome to Out of the Fog. Karen, it is so wonderful to be back with you again. It's I can feel clearly now. The rain is gone. I'm out of the fog. I'm with you. <laughs> Yay! Well, then my work here is done. Thanks for Let's being on just, the show. And, and <laughs> curtsy. <laughs> um, we already, before we even started the recording, we're just laughing our heads off. I love talking <laughs> with you, and it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. When we've talked before, It's always been about dreams and it's always been kind of from that Mm -hmm. doctor dream perspective, right? So there's a little bit of a lab coat. It's a funky lab coat, right? But there's a little bit of a lab coat, a little bit of (laughs) of authority there. Multicolored lab coat. (laughs) Multicolored lab coat with little (laughs) unicorns kind of coming off the shoulders there. But this (laughs) new book has has a vulnerability about it. It's deeply personal and it, and it shifts into a different kind of, area for you. And I wonder if you can say a little bit about that. Was it uncomfortable to shift Mm. like that or did it feel good? Oh, great questions. Um, Yes, it uncomfortable. And also it felt like it, it, it's kind of like that Anais Nin quote. I wish I could quote it exactly something about, and the day came where the the pain it took to stay tightly wrapped in the bud was was more painful than the risk it took mm. to blossom and so it's something along those lines because it's it's kind of like there's there's no pain free option really um i mean exposure is exposure but it it started to feel like like i was being hypocritical and I talk about in the the opening chapter of my book, I talk about kind of a, a hypocrite moment where there's a reporter that's interviewing me, a, a not as nice reporter or, or person interviewing me as you, you would oh. never do such a thing. Never. But this person, never, not in this life, not maybe, maybe on a parallel plane, but who knows, not in this life. But she did a kind of a gotcha to me where she she had been with me in a 12-step program. I forgot it was like 20 years ago. And she remembered me sharing about when I had spent, when I was 21, I was a stripper for a year and it was my deep, deep, deep shame. And, and I shared about that in a 12 step program. And she brought it up in an interview, like a contemporary interview where where I'm now Dr. Dream. I'm no longer buying lingerie at, at trashy lingerie. I'm no longer doing those kind of things. I've established a really a profession and a career that I'm proud of. And then this kind of 
who this this came out of the blue out of the fog it actually created a lot of fog and it mm. was dissonance because i like to teach people that there's no shame in our game that everything that we've ever done even if it was difficult and painful it all serves purpose and and we can use it all so you know i i like to i used to think of myself as the poster child for that only to find out that no i didn't want my past displayed on the cover of the magazine that she was writing for i so i had some work to do and in the process of that i realized i want to have a 360 degree revealing i don't want to have like well you can look at this part of my life but not this and not that mm. you know i want to wear every single thing on my sleeve at all times because that's just not appropriate but i i felt like i had to kind of dig deeper and reveal more and as uncomfortable and scary and heart palpitation -y as as it has been, I feel like it just feels a lot more integrous. My walk and my talk feel like they're more in sync. So I'm grateful for that, that funky reporter. I'm grateful for her for being kind of a backwards angel and propelling me to be more transparent and tell these stories. Mm. So yeah. And for those of you keeping score at home, that's not how 12 step groups work you don't it's, you don't take things people have told you in confidence and then hold them and bring them up to surprise them with in their living room however many years later that was mm -hmm. like that's not how that works how do we how can we as spiritual beings and as people who are on the path of self-knowledge and trying to always grow when someone offends like that in a big mm -hmm. way or a small way like that's not fair that's not how you use that confidential information right. how can we keep our balance through that well this is where my ogle formula comes in because i i like to i like to now teach people it's not just about dreams but we allow dream dream work to kind of be in the background but i give people the assignment to make a list of everything they complain about so if people are listening right now and they want to try that they can just pause the recording and make a list make a little list of the little and big offenses the things that you know are typical chronic complaints and maybe some big ones that have just recently come up some whatever they are and and then walk through the ogle process so shall i shall i do that oh that? would you oh shall yes please okay <clears throat> so if you're listening and you want to do the whole exercise, which I highly recommend you do first, just make a whole laundry list of everything you complain about from the little to the big. And then once you're done with that, pick one could be the big one could be a little one, whatever one you're feeling up to doing. So you identify what is what you complain about. And then so the the OGLE, this is about how to ogle your situation. So let me just step back for a second. To ogle something is to really look at it. In fact, the traditional interpretation of the word ogle is kind of lecherous. I like to transform that perspective and think of it as the way that we can grow and alchemize our circumstance is to get a big, good look at it. Because once we do that, then we start to shift it. It starts to change. So O is, and each letter stands for what to do and how to alchemize it. So O stands for write down what is so offensive about the complaint that you've picked how does that feel in your body does it constrict your breathing does it give you a tummy ache does it just make you feel kind of heavy and shut down does it how is it offensive to your ego does it, does it offend your pocketbook is it does it like what's so upsetting and offensive offensive about whatever it is you're complaining about Ah, and then once you've gotten that, so if you need to pause, go ahead and pause until you've written out all that you are offended by about this thing that you're complaining about. I had somebody, by the way, tell me that they did a 20 page ogle. So 10 of those pages was spent on getting out what was offensive about this one particular relationship she was in. Wow. So anyway, take all the time you need. And then once you're done getting all the O out of your system, then you move to the G. And the G is what's good about this circumstance, what's good about this thing. And maybe we should be 
maybe we should try a, a specific thing, or maybe I'll just go through it in general and then we can unpack it yeah. using an actual example. But so one thing that's always good about everything that bothers us is we would only be offended or bothered by something if we didn't have a strong value on the opposite end of the spectrum. For example, if like the, the reporter who was being sneaky with me, I have a strong value on being kind and being empowering. And I felt like what she was doing was being disempowering. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was good because it helped me to see where my values lie, where my morals lie. And that's a good thing. And um, so we can also, you know, look, we have to look sometimes hard to find what's good. Ultimately, I could say what was good about that, uh, that, that reporter was that she propelled me toward wanting to live a more transparent life. She was also pointing out where I had been hypocritical mm -hmm. and that was as painful as that was, it was good because you can't heal what you can't feel. So once you identify a few, at least I say suggest about two or three good things about that yucky offensive situation. Um, some people, you know, once they start finding the good, they just can't stop. You, you find, you just, you find even more things to that are good about it than than were offensive. Then you move to the L. The L is the looking glass. This is really the hard part, but also the most empowering part. Because when you look in the looking glass, which is also the mirror, you see yourself, where do I do that same thing? Or where have I ever done that? Or how might I ever do that same thing? So in the instance with this, with this reporter who was doing kind of an unethical gotcha to me, I could say, well, what she was really doing was she was seeking the truth. And I also prefer the truth over BS. So, ooh, I'm also kind of like her. I'd rather dig a little deeper with myself and with other people and, and not just take, oh, I'm fine. Everything's great on the surface and get to what's really happening. So, I could also see myself there and, and, you know, I can, and I go on, I elaborate more in the book, but once you get to see even a speck of your behavior in the looking glass, then you move to the E and the E is kind of the next level of how to transform this. This is where you identify how you will elevate yourself with, within your behavior, within your own point of view, your consciousness, what will you do to elevate your circumstance with regards to this issue? So with regards to this reporter, I thought, well, I'm in order to elevate, I want to write about, so at least I have been my the reporter of my own life. I want to write my stories, the stories that I'd be most ashamed or afraid that anybody would find out about me. Not necessarily thinking that it would ever be for public consumption, of course not. This was just for my own therapeutic help. But that was an elevated step for me to do for myself, which is to fully embrace my story, my my whole self, and not expect other people to do what I had been unwilling to do. So O is for what's offensive. G is for what's good about it. L is for the looking glass. And E is for elevates. So if you need to pause to give yourself time to do that at least through one of your complaints then you'll know how to do it and then it can become something that you can do fairly easily you remember you can do it as you're talking to a friend a therapist or even just on a walk you can kind of kind of think your way through that and it it shifts that that negative loop that negative and painful thing that we can find ourselves stuck in sometimes there's i'm wondering as you say this because you're teaching this and the book is out there this is such it is such good stuff how when we can do this consistently mm. when we don't so this is a lovely method and i know that i can do this in my life and i also know that i'm going to fall back into my old negative loop way and then i'm going to have to right. take a breath and come back to the old method right so i just i know already right. i'm going to need to right. work on this when this method is applied consistently what changes in people's lives? What are you seeing changing in the people you're working with because of this? Well, it's amazing because this is it's this is such a simple thing to do. I mean, it's kind of like playing bingo or it's like, you know, or one plus it's just these like 
quick little basic dance steps. But what we do is that without without having um, a simple system, our default mode is to just keep regurgitating the same old negative loops. It's because humans, which we are, I think, Karen, I don't know, maybe you and I are aliens. I'm not sure. <laughs> but but as as humans, at least aliens pretending to be humans, we we're <laughs> habit we're habit makers. We we don't know how to not make habits of things, especially if there's an emotional charge to it. And and it's kind of like the same way that we have recurring dreams are we we keep regurgitating those those habitual places and people and circumstances not just to torture ourselves but i think we we repeat them partly because it's part of our comfort zone but it's also we do it in order to figure out like if we keep retracing our steps back over and over and over eventually there's the hope that we're going to find our way out of that. Like if you ever saw the movie Groundhog's Day mm -hmm. or Groundhog Day, it's it's like we we keep going through the same thing and every bit we every once in a while we get a little bit better and a little bit better and until finally we 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 stop. And often when with dream work people ask me, "Well, what's the function of recurring dreams?" I say so that we can understand a particular terrain and maybe become masterful at it. There was some great Patanjali's quote that said something about why dig hundreds of shallow wells when we could just dig one very deep well. Mm -hmm. And even if we keep digging there and we hit concrete, we can use dynamite and have a breakthrough and keep going deep until we hit the water. So there's in some way our recurring issues are actually our attempt to go really deep, but we can help expedite the process by 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 using this formula so that we just don't stay looping in the problem we can we can like progress it forward as if there was a movie like if we were watching a movie it just keeps playing a certain part over and over until we stop it fast forward a little bit past that little glitchy place and then get and oh, I'll realize oh my god there's more to the story than just this 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 funky part so what i'm finding with people and and with myself because i have to keep doing this because it's it's habitual for me to find things that i complain about is i'm finding like for example this person that just shared with me her 20 page ogle <laughs> she'd had a very deep chronic irritation and upset with her with her niece and her niece just was behaving horribly after after this client of mine had been so generous with her and she was just always like kind of yelling at her in her mind and she said by the time she got through the ogle got to the other side of it it's as if the issue just kind of chilled out it's as if she got the message she got the aha moment mm -hmm. and she noticed oh there's more bandwidth available wow what who would i be without this particular thought form taking up so much space like creating so much fog in other words like what would you do if you were out of the fog like karen hager suggests that we do <laughs> and pop out to the other side then oh who are we on the other side of this it's it's we kind of have to just like with lucid dreaming we sort of need to create a game plan for who we will be i think this will be my book my ogle book 2.0 uh -huh. who will we be on the other side of this loop so that we don't just by default go back in and try to pick it up where it left off and you know keep picking at that old scab <laughs> but find a new thing to start to explore a new reality to explore you're listening to out of the fog and i'm talking with kelly sullivan walden her new book is a crisis is a terrible thing to waste the art of transforming the tragic into magic. And you can find out more about the book and more about all of Kelly's good work at kellysullivanwalden.com or ihadthestrangestdream.com. I'd love to look at, and you mentioned it just for a second there, you were talking about bringing dream work into our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are so, hmm, a lot of us are disconnected from our dreaming lives. And mm -hmm. what I'm mm -hmm. getting from reading this book and and feeling into the Ogle method is that our uh, willingness to stop and look clearly at something, especially something that triggers us or that we're ashamed of, that we're upset by, or that is hurtful, our willingness to stop and look at something helps us connect with it in a new way. Mm -hmm. So when we take that 
Ogle method or that idea of looking clearly maybe into our dream lives as well. Is there a way this can be applied to nightmares like scary Mm -hmm. dreams that we have, as well as the kind of scary dreams come true that happen in our real life? Yes, absolutely. So it's, I believe that a nightmare is an unfinished dream. I'm known for saying this and I say it all the time. And the idea, this was because this was what a therapist told me when I was in actually at the very, very, very beginning of my path of consciousness, I had been having a series of terrifying nightmares. Um, One of them was about being, having this very angry man insist that I put this crying baby into, I wrap her in cellophane and put her in a silverware drawer. That was the dream I remember I brought into this therapist. It was so traumatizing because I did exactly what the man said. I, even though I didn't want to, I wrapped this crying baby in cellophane and made her tiny, tiny, tiny and shoved her in the drawer. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, she's not gonna be able to breathe. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm killing her. And so I pull her out of the silverware drawer and I'm, eh, oh my God, I'm so upset. So the, when I shared this with with the with the therapist, she said, okay, well, a nightmare is an unfinished dream. You are the director of this dream. You get to finish the dream. So this is one of the things I'm known for. I'm known for teaching people is to, if you're, if you wake up, first of all, your, your job as the director of your dream is to complete the story as if it was, you were the writer, you were the director, it's your movie. So she asked me what I would do. And I said, well, well, at at the end of the dream, I, pulled the the little girl out of the drawer. But if I was going to pick the dream up where it left off, I would unwrap her from the cellophane and I would tell the man to F off and I would get out of that house wherever I was. And, and I would, and I would ask the crying baby what she needed. And, Mm -hmm. and I would take care of her if she was hungry, if she was sad, if she needed reassurance or whatever it was. And obviously I, I learned later every character in the dream is an aspect of self. So I was the angry man. I was the part of me that had been shoving my own wild emotions, my younger, maybe maybe un, uncivilized emotions into the, into the silverware drawer with saran wrap wrapped around me. And I was also the crying baby that just had so much pain and so much sadness that was just that there was no place to put it. And, and I was also the me that could, that, that was strong enough and big enough if I let myself take care of myself finally. So that was, that was the beginning of that. And so first of all, I suggest that we take a moment to play out the way that we wish the dream would end and, and consider that the dream isn't over until we feel empowered. And then once we're done with that, then I suggest that we use the Ogle method on the dream itself to kind of give it another layer of healing. So what was offensive about that dream? In my dream, it was it was a shutting down. It was me being complicit in shutting down this little girl, like even killing her. That was even more horrible than this angry barking man telling me what to do. And then what's good about all of that is, again, you can't heal what you can't feel. So that was good that it was so it brought it brought it to my attention so I could finally really look at it and do something with it. And I did. I scheduled myself a therapy session and that therapy led to a whole bunch of unraveling and and in in the best way possible. And so there was a lot of good that came from this horrible nightmare in the looking glass. Basically, the looking glass is to look at how every and with it's easier sort of to do this with dreams, but it is applicable in our waking life too. or in dreams. Carl Jung taught that every character and everything in the dream is us. So I am looking into the looking glass, as I already mentioned, I'm the little girl. I am the angry man. I am the cellophane. I am the silverware drawer. I'm all these, these parts of self. So how are all of these me? That's what to explore. And then the E for elevate is now that I know this, what will I do to transform? How can I elevate my circumstance? And for me, based on that dream, it was, I am going to find an outlet when I start to feel, when I need to cry, 
I'm going to give myself permission to cry. If I'm feeling rageful, I want to at least hit some pillows or go on a jog or do something, anything but squash the feeling. Maybe I'm not, it's not about acting it out and punching everybody in the face if I feel mad, but it's about finding a healthy outlet for that energy. So we can do this with dreams and then we do it in our waking life. Sometimes having dreams to, to consider that everything's a dream, it makes it a little bit easier from that perspective to look at everything that we're offended by as an aspect of ourselves. Sometimes we can suspend our disbelief a little bit easier when it comes to a dream. And then we can transfer that same ability as we look at our lives, look at political figures, look at our spouse, look at our neighbor, like they're all me. What do they represent? What part of me is this part of me acting out? And I'm, I'm really struck by, and I hadn't thought of it this way before. Mm -hmm. You know, I started by saying, you know, heartbreak and misfortune and all things yeah. happen in earth school, right? So all, we get all the yeah. stuff here. Yeah. But if I take that idea that a nightmare is a dream that is unfinished and that the dream doesn't end until I am empowered, Yes, I can feel into the transformative aspect of what you're sharing now here, because mm -hmm. it means that whatever was done to me or whatever I did or whatever I went through or whatever is happening to happening to me now, these things don't need to be finished. I can look at them and transform mm -hmm. them until yes. I am empowered. And that so that so wow. Yes. So that. Yes. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. So even if in our waking reality, which is still a dream. So we can, that's why we can apply all the same principles of dream work to our waking dream, the dream that we're having right now. It's just this particular waking dream is a bit more dense. It takes a little bit more time, but it's still a dream. We can still transform it and we can, and just by using our imagination, our imagination, plus a little bit of magical thinking, like tap into that childlike aspect of us. Hopefully she's not covered in cellophane in a silverware drawer. If she is, then untuck her and bring her out. But we and use our imagination to just to glimpse a vision of what might I be like on the other side of this complaint or this upset? Like if things did go my way, or if I did receive the, the payoff of having gone through this, then what might be there on the other side so we can imagine it it might actually play out a little bit differently but we can begin to create those synapses in our brain instead of just looping 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 i actually once had a dream that i was named loopy everyone was calling me loopy and i'm like that's not my name i'm like oh i keep doing the same loop i am loopy oh my god <laughs> we can oh yes finish the story let's stop staying in that same place what would happen if we had that breakthrough moment like bill murray in groundhog's day where once he starts getting oh i'm affecting the way this is going well what else might i do then it's like the tipping point happens and then that cascade of thoughts of like, oh, we can change so many things. Oh, let me add them. What can I do? It starts with us imagining it. I love that. And I know the clock is catching us here. Yes. Is there something you'd like to leave the listeners with something you really want them to know? Oh, well, first of all, I, I think the reason why I'm, I'm really into this Ogle formula, which by the way, is a conglomeration of tens of thousands thousands of self-help mind body spirit modalities that i've learned over the last 25 years and it, but i've made it simple and i feel like what I, what i love about it is the first part of it the o is the permission to be upset so it's not about let's just so quickly go to being enlightened and i think many of us who listen to your show who who are on this spiritual path we in some way kick our own selves in the butts by not being by being upset we're like no i'm fine i'm fine <laughs> i think we need to just give ourselves a minute to be upset to be offended and to explore what that is before we get into the g for what's good about it and then move into the looking glass and then the elevated so give yourself a break and and i've i heard once that self that you can't have real compassion for anyone else until you have self-compassion first so 
be kind to yourself, be generous with yourself, be so loving to yourself. And by God, if you've got a little baby aspect of yourself that's tucked away in a silverware drawer, pull her out, let her feel or him feel, and then, and then, and then move on to looking for what the good is and then get out of that house where that angry man is that's your that's your critic by the way the critic will chill out once you know once once you it knows that you that you've got a hold of this situation that you're in control now and we can thank that big bully critic and say thank you so much but you can chill out now i've got this i've got my little crying baby we're going to be okay oh. kelly thank you so much for talking with me today Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun to be with you. Oh Always. my gosh. You are you are welcome anytime. That is Kelly Sullivan Walden. We've been talking about some of the good stuff in her new book, A Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Waste, The Art of Transforming the Tragic into Magic. You can connect with Kelly and all that she does in the world at kellysullivanwalden.com or ihadthestrangestdream.com. And of course, you're always welcome over at karenhager.com. It's a great place to find out about upcoming classes and events. You can even book a private intuitive session with me there if you're so inclined. And the fun continues on Instagram where you can see what odd misshapen knitting thing am I working on, what jigsaw puzzles on my puzzle board, you follow the adventures of Maisie the dog, and there's more out of the fog, con you know, as an afterthought, more out of the fog content there for you as well. I am Fog City Psychic on Instagram. And thank you for listening today. Together we are spreading a little more light in the world, and a little more light is always a good thing. Until next time, I'm wishing you peace.